as you might have guessed from our from our name, is a world where no one dies of a mosquito bite. We call this series The Path to Zero because that's what we're here to talk about, how we end humanity's oldest, deadliest disease in our lifetimes. Before we get started, I'd like to say a huge thanks to our partners at Best Regard for their sponsorship of this event and for the life-saving work they make possible. And I want to thank our three panelists, whom I'll introduce shortly. As we start our dialogue, Let's start by taking stock of what we face as we embark on the path to zero. Despite historic progress over the past 15 years, a child still dies of malaria nearly every minute. So that's a long way to go from zero. We've got our work cut out for us. But today we have new hope. Last year, the WHO announced its endorsement of the world's first malaria vaccine with the potential to save millions of lives. There's exciting progress on technologies like monoclonal antibodies and other breakthroughs are in the pipeline and will follow soon. At Malaria No More, we see this as a moment that's full of promise for the billions of people who go to sleep every night at risk of contracting malaria. In fact, we've never been more confident in the purpose or the possibility really of our mission to end deaths from mosquito bites. But for this, the first in our Path to Zero Technology Spotlight series, it's fitting that we're starting with the fundamental tools of prevention, nets, spraying, and larvicide. If the malaria campaign had a mascot, it would be an insecticide-treated bed nets. Uh, nets have been hailed as, as perhaps the single most effective tool in the war against malaria, and arguably, for that matter, in all of global health. Last year, we celebrated the delivery of the two billionth net in the past 20 years. And a recent uh, study that tracked over 22 years the effect of nets in Tanzania showed that sleeping under a mosquito net in childhood has measurable health benefits that persist into adulthood. Indoor residual spraying has become a mainstay of seasonal campaigns to decrease malaria transmission, and it's a great complement to nets. And larvicide, meanwhile, has been used in a more targeted way in key geographies, but it has the potential to greatly reduce the population of mosquitoes that spread malaria. These tools may not be the ones that dominate headlines, but they're really the workhorses of the malaria campaign. It's estimated that they account for 60% or more of the historic progress we've seen. 10.6 million lives saved, 1.7 billion malaria cases averted, $2 trillion in economic benefits unlocked for malaria-affected communities. 60% of that progress is due to the tools that we're talking about today. Their impact is one of the big reasons that the effective altruism movement has recognized malaria as one of the best humanitarian investments in the world. But we face mounting and fast evolving challenges in delivering on the full promise of these tools. First access, roughly one third of people who need mosquito nets still don't have them, even in high burden countries like Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Growing resistance to pyrethroids, a key component of nets and spraying is an urgent and glow, uh, growing challenge. Resistance has been found in 87% of reporting countries and 68% of testing sites. And finally, larvicide applications have been sidelined as too complex to manage in many parts of the world despite their obvious benefits. Overcoming these challenges will require major investment and innovation, even amidst the constant pressure to make these tools more affordable. Over the past 15 years, We've seen a pretty dramatic decline in the unit cost of bed nets, for instance, from roughly $5 per net 15 years ago to under $2 today. These cost efficiencies have allowed us to stretch global resources and save more lives. But it can also cause us to overlook the need for investment in R&D to face the insecticide resistance challenge and to invest more in more expensive but more effective next generation products where the data shows that they'll save more lives. For the next hour, I have the privilege of hosting a conversation with three leading voices in malaria innovation, three CEOs who will share their perspective on the need for continuous improvement to the prevention tools that have been foundational to the global malaria fight. I'm looking forward to hearing their thoughts and insights on how their respective organizations are driving innovation around these tried and true technologies. I'll begin by introducing Vestergaard CEO, uh, Michael Yost. Vestergaard, of course, designs and manufactures long-lasting insecticidal bed nets, and I'm sure we'll learn today about what goes into evolving those tools. Michael joined Vestergaard after 25 years of experience in med tech and biotech, where he developed a track record of building high-impact teams 
in startup growth stage and mature business environments. So he brings that depth of experience to Vestergaard at a time of innovation and, and really disruption in the net, the net campaign. Welcome and thank you, Michael, for Vestergaard's leadership in the malaria fight. I also wanna to welcome to today's dialogue, Dr. Nick Heyman, CEO of the Innovative Vector Control Consortium. IVCC is a product development partnership accelerating the discovery of new insecticides and other vector control innovations. IVCC brings together industry, academia, and other public health stakeholders to enable the development, delivery, and impact of novel and improved vector control tools, especially where markets have failed to promote the innovation that's needed to combat insecticide resistance. It's great to have you join the panel today, Nick. Finally, I'm pleased to welcome CEO of Zap Malaria, Arnan Khoury Yafin. Zap is a startup using artificial intelligence to improve vector control targeting and eliminate malaria. Arnan founded Zap Malaria in 2016 after leading the R&D team at Site Diagnostics, where he saw firsthand the impact of malaria on children. Arnon's co-authored numerous papers and patents and has won academic excellence prizes, including IBM's Watson AIX Prize and the 2021 Cisco Global Problem Solver Challenge. Uh, Arnon, thanks for contributing to today's important discussion. Uh, Arnon, I know you're also joining from Mozambique where the power has been flickering off and on. So we hope you're able to, to stay with us uh, throughout the, the conversation. Finally, yeah. we're excited to engage the audience in today's discussion. So I'll start by inviting remarks from each of our panelists, and then I'll turn to some questions coming from folks watching this live. For those using Zoom, you'll have the option to submit questions through the platform. I encourage you to do so, and as much as possible, we'll incorporate those into the conversation. We're also simulcasting on Facebook Live. And we plan to make this forum accessible for later viewing via the Malaria No More website. That's enough from me. Now let's hear from the experts to understand how Vestergaard, IBCC, and ZAP are charting the path to zero. So Nick, let's start with you and IBCC. Uh, obviously a huge portion, portion of the progress in reducing malaria deaths is attributable to insecticides, whether they're used in long lasting nets, applied in indoor residual spraying campaigns, or used in targeted sugar baits to control mosquito population. And sometimes we take these tools for granted but insecticide resistance is a very real threat uh, and, and it uh, threatens to undermine our progress. So to start us off, tell us how IBCC works. What does the problem look like today? And what is IBCC doing to ensure the world has a pipeline of new insecticides to preserve these vital tools in the malaria fight? Yeah, thanks, thanks Martin. Is, I guess my sound is turned on. If everybody can hear me, let me know. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll start, I'll start by saying, because I've just read a document that's just gone on our website uh, and it's entitled brand, it's brand new actually, it's entitled Envisioning Insecticide Resistance Management and Integrated Vector Management, a zero by 40 perspective. So if you have an interest in a kind of an in-depth look at, at how uh, vector control partners, particularly industry is, is, is trying to tackle resistance and, and deal with uh, resistance management when there are very few products around, please go on and, and download that. It's, it's very, very readable. So Martin's already talked about the rollout of nets, uh, particularly around the year 2000 and how that's had a big impact around 11 million live saves. And actually Martin talked about 60%, but if you add, add in IRS into, into uh, onto nets, uh, the, the, the statistics are around 79% of lives saved um, in, in that 20 or at least 15 year period up to 2015 when that work modeling work was published, it's around, it is around 79%. So the growing risk of insecticide resistance really uh, threatens uh, the reductions in malaria related illness uh, and deaths over the past two decades. And given the fact that the, the number of classes of chemistry available to vector control is, is so few, and there is a real urgency in bringing some of these new chemistries forward. Uh, and that's really, I guess, linked to the, the, the better than basics theme of, of, of this particular uh, event. So we need, uh, we need products, uh, new products to address widespread resistance. Uh, and as Martin said, widespread is exactly pretty much everywhere we look for it today. Um, IVCC was started uh, in 2005 at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, mostly by a few forward thinking people who recognize actually that resistance to, to NETS and IRS would develop quickly uh, as these products ramped up. 
and, and also because the active ingredient of choice at the time were the synthetic pyrethroids and they're still there and you know un, un, in many ways unfortunately they're ubiquitous in agriculture and also in household use which is part of the challenge um, so we, we started with a grant uh, from the Gates Foundation in 2005. Today we have eight, eight funders, and there's some of them are core funders and very upstream in the research, and some of them more downstream, focused very specifically on access and market shaping. And those are organizations like Unitaid and the Global Fund. So just going back um, to your questions on resistance, uh, Martin, uh, we knew it would happen. We have experience from agriculture, from drugs, uh, and the best probably known example of course, is antibiotic resistance, which is equally scary. Uh, we know the basic principles of how resistance happens and how to avoid it. Uh, product combinations and rotations of different classes of chemistry. Uh, but there really just aren't enough or there weren't enough tools to be able to even operate uh, an, an IRM, an insecticide resistance management program. So, you know, it's something else I think that 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 everybody needs to understand that insects and mosquitoes in particular have this amazing ability to adapt to whatever you can throw at them. So unlike in agriculture where you're looking for short residual life chemistries, bed nets you need them to last for three years and 20 wash cycles and, and indoor residual spraying for at least six months and a year is much better. So you have high selection pressure over an extended period on an insect that has a very short generation time, maybe 20 up to 20 generations a year. So the chance of a resistant gene becoming at the dominant form is, is very, very high. So and also resistance when uh, when I started in the industry in the 80s, it was a lot simpler. It seemed a lot simpler. Um, we used to focus on target site resistance and KDR, which is knockdown resistance. But today you have a whole range of other uh, mechanisms, upregulated up P450 enzymes, cuticular thickening, and the strangest one of all, behavioral resistance, where mosquitoes have adapted to avoid uh, feeding uh, into the night and uh, feed more in the day. Um, so they've, they've really changed their behavior uh, and feeding patterns. So just very quickly, IVCC is one of 12 PDPs uh, in, in the public health space. Um, we focus on uh, malaria in Africa, but we're also working uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, um, with, with help and support from the UK and the Australian governments. We partner, as, as Martin said, with, with, with chemical companies, uh, with donors, academia, NGOs, and do everything really from R&D, basic discovery, right through to delivery and then monitoring impact to make sure that a dollar spent uh, on, a, on a new intervention is, is going to give us the biggest return for investment. So we have had a, a, a real success in the past 16 years of bringing products to market. We've got a complete portfolio of IRS tools with two more sitting uh, in, in WHO PQ waiting to be uh, qualified, hopefully this year. And I'll just throw a statistic out because it is important to know these tools work. Um, over the uh, estimated over six years, and, and not by us, but by others, these products have protected uh, an additional 310 million people, averted somewhere between 13 and 27 million malaria cases, and say between 40 and 68,000 lives. So product, new products work. I won't go into uh, Interceptor G2 and the other dual active ingredient insecticides because I, um, I, I, sus I suspect Michael and others might talk about that. But if anybody's interested, um, in the Lancet, there was a, a recent publication in March looking at these new chemistries, and I will I will go in and, and quote. I'm going to read it, uh, and not, otherwise I'll get it wrong. So in March, in the, in the Lancet, children aged six months to 14 years had 55% lower odds of having malaria two years after net distribution, and children aged six months to 10 years had 44% lower malaria incidence over, over the two years over over pyrethroids alone. So, you know, just to provide a sense of the challenge and risk that innovation faces, we started as an organization with about four and a half million compounds, uh, chem chemicals in a chemical library. And today we're down to about four to five uh, and many millions have been spent to get there. So that's, that's the lost rate. Um, just delivering a product's not enough. Uh, we have to make sure that when we deliver them, that, 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 that the industry and the stakeholders and stick to very, very clear code of conduct and best um, in integrated pest management principles and insecticide 
rotations, otherwise we're going to lose the chemistry we've got. But actually to protect the chemistry we've got, we've got to get new nets uh, out into the marketplace that have no cross resistance with the, the, the existing net. So just very quickly to round this off so other people have their chance. The product pipeline is, is robust, um, but the whole process is very fragile. You know, PDPs rely on sustained, diverse and flexible funding, which we mostly get. But obviously we're going through a challenge now where countries and funders are seeing their, their economic um, st uh, situation shrink or decline dramatically because of COVID. So we want to finish the job quickly and efficiently. Uh, I was asked um, by the Malaria No More team a, a couple of days ago to say something about what, what funding would be needed to get us um, close to zero, or at least deliver the portfolio of tools that are in the pipeline today. It's a hard one, but I, I would suggest somewhere between 250 and 300 million over the next seven years is required to allow, allow the delivery uh, of the novel active ingredient programs formulated in new nets uh, and to launch or finish other programs such as attractive targeted sugar baits. So I think modeling tells us that in, that in, in most settings uh, with, with a high coverage of these tools, we can get malaria transmission really close to zero, but not quite there, uh, particularly if you layer in all other interventions, including drugs, chemo, malaria, uh, sorry, drugs, vaccines, and also, and also larvicides, which are becoming important tool. So these tools are expensive. Uh, they need also support in the market, uh, market shaping support, 50 to 100 million probably for every one of these new products because they're gonna come in at more expensive than the existing products, but they are going to do a much better job. So I think that um, the PDPs really represent us kind of the, the best sort of public private uh, uh, company interaction and, and true approach to translational science. So I'll leave it there. That's terrific, Nick. Really, really instructive, really informative. Um, you know, a couple numbers that jump out. The, the fact that we have 20, up to 20 generations of mosquitoes per year does create that, that pressure. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's really an arms race. Uh, and so, you know, resistance isn't a surprise. It's something we need to plan for. Just a quick follow-up question. So the 250 to 300 million over the next seven years uh, is very clear. But how many novel formulations and, and combinations do you think we'd need to get us between here and the, the end game? That may be a, a hard question to answer, but um, you know, if we're, if we're down to, I think you said four to five compounds, how, how do we need to flesh out that? Uh, well, I think if you could, I, I think if you could get all four of all, all four or five of those into uh, formulated in nets and as effective as the ones we're testing currently, we have the ability to rotate those chemistries and not rely on a single mode of action. However, I think those of us in product development have been doing it, doing it for a long time, myself included. You know, I came out of the ag industry. You know, ke chemistries fall uh, at, at a fence uh, and, and many fall, hence the four and a half million down to, down to four to five. We think the ones we have today are very, very deliverable. We, we, we understand the toxicology of them. We know how they work. We think we can formulate them. In fact, we know in many cases. Uh, so I, I think if we can get at least three of those of those four to five into the marketplace, just as we have done and provided uh, or about to provide a complete portfolio of IRS tools, we really have we really have enough to protect us. Uh, I would say all the way through to elimination in most circumstances if those chemistries are not used and abused. And that means going back to a code of conduct and best practices and making sure that, that, that these chemistries are affordable so people want to use them and not revert back to inferior, inferior products. Terrific. I hope, I hope that answers. I, it, it, there's a much longer answer to that, but I won't sure. attempt it. <laughs> well, it, we, we do have a follow-up question in the chat, so maybe look to that and, and you can answer that as we, as we turn sure. to our next speaker. So turning to you, Arnon, uh, hopefully your battery life on your, your laptop is, uh, is stable. We've heard a little bit about your companies at Malaria, mainly that you were last year's recipient of the highly prized Watson Award for AI. So tell us about that. What inspired Zap? Why Malaria uh, as the first application of, of these innovations? And, and what do you think AI can contribute to this effort to end Malaria? 
Thank you. So thank God uh, we currently have the electricity. Um, so artificial intelligence is part, can you hear me properly? Yes, we can hear you great. Okay, so currently, just a minute, I take my volume down. Uh, AI is being used in so many applications of life. So people don't know that, but even this Zoom call, uh, the line is optimized by AI because if I just use the uh, uh, bandwidth that this internet give me, your, my voice quality would be very bad. But AI takes my voice and, gen and then enhance it, it makes, it makes it better. So if AI can improve maybe every aspect of our lives, we must take it to maybe the essential aspect of saving lives, uh, uh, like malaria. In malaria, uh, I am born in Israel. Uh, in Israel, uh, malaria is part of our education from primary school. The story of winning malaria is not only about uh, health and saving lives, it's also the story about building a nation. If we, we, uh, we must have won the fight against the disease to, uh, to make the state of Israel. And I really believe that that's true for every, every country with malaria. Um, that we can save so many lives with that, but we can also prevent poverty. And that is a, a, a thing we, so important things. Um, yes, I personally started with malaria because I joined a startup by the, my friend uh, started about malaria diagnostics using machine vision. Machine vision is a form of AI. Uh, uh, we auto automatized a uh, microscopy. And this is the second one. Uh, yes. Thanks. Thanks, Arnon. Uh, quick follow-up question uh, for you. Um, you know, I, I see that Israel eliminated malaria in, in 1968. Uh, you know, it's been uh, 30 years since the, the U.S., uh, well, substantially more uh, now, uh, you know, 50 years since the U.S. Uh, eliminated malaria. And yet, as we talked about at the, at the top of, of this session, uh, a child still dying every minute. So that's a that's a long time for us to see some success in some places and and not others. And we know that successful malaria efforts have always layered multiple approaches and control techniques onto each other. I, I know one of the areas you're working in is is larvicide. How does larvicide fit into the mix? How how can it be combined uh, with other approaches? And and what additional uh, data or or demonstration do we need? Uh, for people to see the value of, of that approach. So let me start by explaining the connection between AI and larviciding. Maybe the connection is not trivial for many people here. Uh, what we do with AI, we connect it to larviciding in three layers. The first layer is the planning phase. So before doing larviciding, we analyze satellite imagery to know where the houses are, are to know where, which areas are suitable for water bodies, for example, valleys, green areas. Uh, we also add the rain data to the, this AI analysis. So, so, and by the way, for some area we say, no, those areas are not good for larvae siding. In those areas, the water body, the houses are too uh, uh, far away from each other and we predict too many water bodies. So this is the planning phase. Then the, in the implementation phase, uh, AI, just improve the, operationally improve the larvae siding by assigning tasks by, uh, because larvae siding is data intensive operation. Where the water bodies are, are they positive, negative? Many questions. And then maybe the last one is the most interesting one. After you did larvae siding, after you mapped all of the water bodies, after you saw if you have larva in the water, like anopheles mosquito larva in the water bodies or don't, this data, can give so many to other intervention. So I'll give just very simple example. You can do targeted IRS based on the data of the location of water bodies. I mean, very specific, a, a very high resolution data. So if I have water body here, I want to spray the houses around the water body. Or for, ex a, for example, a different way of AI planning that if 
we have someone which is positive to malaria. So today, some countries, when you have someone positive to malaria, you test and treat all of the people around the house of that person. But if you have actually the data, not only about where the person are, but also where the water bodies are, maybe you have someone a, a positive here, but you need to treat the people here because the mosquito go to the water body and then bite the second person. So AI can use larvae sighting data to optimize other interventions. Uh, and then for your, the last part of your question about how can we know that that works? So I think it is important to balance between randomized control trial uh, to is it rigorously estimate cost effectiveness, uh, uh, but we cannot test every uh, uh, small improvement in the system with randomized control trial. We must also use some logic, some very small trial. Uh, yeah, thanks. That. Thanks, thanks, Hernan. Uh, you know what strikes me about your answer is, uh, you know, AI isn't something that that only exists between people, like your example from Zoom. You know what you're you're talking about is is really tangible and tactical and human uh, elements of of these campaigns. You know what bodies of water we target, even how you kind of issue and prioritize assignments uh, for the people who are actually going out and and doing larvicide and how that's optimized for others. So it's a it's a compelling example as we try to find new ways to find efficiencies in the deployment of of these tools. Um, a quick correction of the record before someone corrects me in the in the chat. Uh, the U.S. eliminated malaria in 1951, so it's 70 years uh, since we eliminated. And uh, please treat that as a cautionary tale for doing math on the fly uh, in a Zoom Zoom meeting. Um, Michael, let's turn to you and Vestergaard's role in all of this. Uh, so we've heard from Nick and Arnon about promising innovations, but also about some of the associated challenge. What else is on the horizon in terms of these vector control fundamentals? Do you see a silver bullet? What innovations is Vestergaard working on? Michael, you're muted. That is there uh, the statement of the, of the, of the century at the moment. Um, Martin, thanks so much for inviting me to the panel. Um, Really impressed with the work you guys are doing at Malaria No More. Also, always a pleasure to be on a panel with Nick and the great work that the IVCC team is doing. Phenomenal. We love working with both of you. Uh, and Arnon, thanks very much for injecting some uh, technological sex appeal into this uh, conversation about how to, how to fight malaria. Great innovation coming through there. Uh, so Vestigard is very known for Innovation, of course, there used to be a time when people used to dip nets into buckets to recharge them with the insecticide. And, and we put, amongst others, uh, the insecticide coated it onto a bed net. Permanent 2.0 uh, was ultimately the most widely deployed bed net of all time in history as a result. Um, we invented, so Investigator invented the PBO class of product, which today is the standard of care in high insecticide resistance areas. We look into bioabsorbable plastics uh, to try and see whether we can you know, do something there. Uh, we're still putting 100,000 tons of plastic in, uh, mainly into Africa. That's, if anybody wants to know, the same as covering Manhattan Island 44 times. Um, and uh, I think we need to do a better job there, all of us. We look at design, roof only, um, products, mix of polyethylene versus polyester. Anyway, new class of insecticides, Nick has already referred to. We look at recycling, upcycling, uh, and even digital innovation. Um, we have, believe it or not, one of the biggest uh, two-way dialogue databases uh, of net users um, anywhere in public health that we believe would hopefully uh, increase the, the, the usage of bed nets. And you know, if, if usage is a function of protection, then more usage will lead to better protection as well. Your question is around silver bullets. I'm afraid we don't have a silver bullet. Um, and I also think that the low hanging fruits have all kind of been picked. And uh, what we need is a more sophisticated dialogue, a more sophisticated multifactorial discussion 
You mentioned earlier on bed nets are, in my belief or our belief, probably the most uh, effective and even cost effective public health tool uh, ever. 60 plus percent of incident rates are directly attributed, to, the reduction of incident rates are directly attributed to the humble bed net. And a mere five dollars can get you protection for two people for three years. But the challenges are immense. Insecticide resistance, Nick has already referred to, is one of them. Can we better manage the mix of insecticides available to us also in the pipeline that Nick has referred to, to help proactively uh, manage the, the pressure on each one of these insecticides or the insecticide resistance uh, risk. And the products are also more complex. Um, we forget that these are humble products, but they're also scientifically sophisticated product. We have uh, two active chemical ingredients that we put on a polymer science product that elude um, these chemis chemistries over a three year period. Uh, and so that's quite, a, it's quite an achievement on its own. We have bioefficacy issues. We have longevity issues. How long does, how long is bio, uh, the chemistry actually available on the earth surface over the duration uh, of time after, after a, a mass campaign? And last but not least, we also have the oil price, right? The oil price um, has been at historic lows, uh, historic, they've been at incredible lows um, during the COVID time. And of course, uh, polyethylene and polyester out of which we make bed nets uh, are a direct derivative of oil. And if one third of your price is directly linked to that, you can see that massive fluctuations in oil price have an, have, have an, an impact. So all of these issues, um, insecticide risk, resistance, resistance management, more complicated chemistry, more complicated products, longevity, oil price, and so on, would lead us to believe that you know, uh, these products would become more expensive um, in the future. And, and I think Nick's already touched on that. And certainly, unless we become more sophisticated in our dialogue, I think they would. And that, of course, will come with trade-offs none of us really want, such as volume versus quality, right? Do you uh, have a bigger coverage of the population, but with less effective nets, as an example, or uh, products that, are, that, are, that last longer, have a higher longevity, but again, you need to put less of them out there so you have less people covered ultimately. And so none of these trade-offs <clears throat> is where we wanna be, especially since bed nets, and I think you've alluded to it already, are kind of the foundation of the fight against malaria, right? Everything else is layered on top of it, whether it's IRS, seasonal, seasonal chemo prevention, vaccines, larvicide reduction, all these pieces are really layered above uh, on top of the net. So um, if we don't do a good job with bed nets, uh, quite frankly, we don't do a good job, period. And we have interesting tools, uh, some of which we maybe can discuss more at some other time, but catalytic funding, fantastic tools. Um, they're, much, they're much needed. However, we also need to uh, bear in mind that the market is fairly small, players are fairly few. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that these very tools don't become market distorting mechanisms uh, at the same time. But at the end of the day, for me, um, the biggest opportunity, honestly, with all of this, because I know we will, with the help of IBCC and others, we will, will crack, will crack the, let's say the specification aspect, the chemistry aspect, the specification aspect of what these tools should look like. Um, <clears throat> but the topic of your, of your webinar is, is better than basics. And I'd, I'd like to um, postulate that, that we also need to become better at the basics. Even just being good at the basics or being better at the basics will help us, I believe, to reduce cost of these uh, tools, even when they become more sophisticated and, and more expensive to make, whilst at the same time increasing their effectiveness. So on the quality side, I even believe we can make them more green, uh, greener, more environmentally friendly in terms of their production process and, and the fact that they're plastics, et cetera. And maybe even uh, put in a dose of local manufacturing um, into that mix as well. I think all of that is possible, provided we as an industry 
um, have a better cross-functional collaborative platform between the demand and the supply side and all the other stakeholders that are, that are in between. We just need to get better at the basics. We need to get better at simple supply chain management. And I think if we, as key stakeholders, have more of a long-term view of demand, for instance, or more collaborative approach with some of the, uh, the key stakeholders, the, the key donor organizations, we're also willing to put a lot more money into um, cost reduction aspects, such as automation, as an example. Uh, people may not realize that for every 10 million bed nets that are made, there's approximately 1,200 people employed. So if you calculate that over 200 plus million bed nets every year, you got 25 plus 1,000 people that are making these bed nets. And inconsistency in demand patterns does not allow effective uh, uh, supply chain management. And, and as a result, the cost is kind of stuck in a certain place at the moment. And I believe we can get that cost, uh, cost down, whilst at the same time uh, work with the IBCC and others on, 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 better, on better, more effective products going forward. Terrific, thank you, thank you, Michael. So many important points in, in what you, you laid out. Um, one quick follow-up question for you. Uh, you know, this conversation has, has talked about a contrast between kind of nets and, and other tools, but you know, one of the themes that we're seeing is, is the, the combination of these things. You know, even for people who are uh, so excited about the advent of the first malaria vaccine. You know, it wasn't long after the, uh, the, the announcement of, of the results uh, that, that we saw a 70% increase in the efficacy of, of the malaria vaccine when you combined it with bed nets and seasonal malaria chemo prevention. So can, can you just say a word about, instead of thinking of this as either or, or how we should think about this as, as maybe both and, well, it's, it's exactly as, as, as you say, right? That we need, we need to ultimately have these um, protections that are layered one on top of the other. And, you know, local organizations, local um, malaria programs, they sometimes look at lowering incidents, uh, sorry, lowering death rates and not lowering incidents necessarily. So they understand that of course there is a correlation between incidents and death rates, but sometimes you can just improve one part of the system, such as a, a, more, a quicker diagnosis, a quicker response rate on say getting the antimalarials to the actual people who need it, as opposed to just over, over medicating um, in, order to get your, in order to get your hits, right? And, and I think this is an area where I'm glad to see a new technology like uh, the one that uh, Arnon and others are, are bringing in because I think we need to become more sophisticated um, as, a, as a community in just using these tools more efficiently and effectively at the end of the day. And I think data um, is, is certainly one way to do that. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Michael. So let's open it up to the, the broader group. Uh, I would encourage people to um, uh, supply more questions uh, and we can we can integrate those into the conversation. I'm reading as I'm speaking, which again is always always dangerous. Uh, reading as these questions come in. Uh, Nick, maybe a, a question back to you, and then invite others to comment as well. You know, we we've talked about these categories of nets, uh, IRS and and larvicide, but there are a, a whole range of of new. Uh, prevention technologies and, and vector control technologies that you're looking at and thinking about. Can you give us a, a sense of that, you know, if you widen the aperture slightly, what else is out there that you think may be critical to solving these challenges? Yeah, that's a good question. I, 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 I'll stay out of the GM space and the Wolbachia space because there are many others that would do a much better job of, of me, but I mean, what's IVCC working on after you know, 15 years with, of looking at hundreds, literally hundreds of, of in, innovations from many, many uh, either individual innovators or, or universities? Um, 
it's very, very clear from modeling that if we don't do something about outdoor transmission, we, we, we're probably not going to be get as close to zero as, as we as we should. We put out a call for proposals in 2014 and we, we, we looked at three different interventions and we came up and and have seriously funded one called ATSB, Attractive Targeted Sugar Baits, actually coming out of technology from Israel again. Uh, and they are now in their second year of, of trials, um, started off in Mali. Uh, where we got a good proof of concept, uh, and now and now that we're in full scale epi epi studies in in Zambia, uh, Kenya, uh, and also Mali, uh, and uh, with 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 very interesting, exciting tools. This is this is basically not take this is bringing the mos bringing the mosquito to the insecticide, not not the other way around, and 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 it's using a baiting technology which massively brings down the 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 the, the amount of insecticide you need need to use which will bring down cost etc and it's an intervention that there could be some really creative ways of delivering it because a lot of the cost of these interventions is not so much in the nets or the irs but it's actually is actually spraying irs etc um the other thing we've been looking at um uh, that's been very important is 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 really dealing with last mile malaria you know, we, there is a global experience of what happens when you take your foot off the gas and everything body thinks the problem is solved and it isn't and, and you're right back to square one so we've been working uh, we started off with 29 interventions and we've been really working on about on about nine of them doing studies in 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 in, in um, actually in asia which is where they kind of have the the border malaria issue primarily uh, looking at uh, personal protection looking at spatial repellents looking at uh, looking at protective clothing uh, and it's some surprisingly interesting results. So that's another area that, you know, we're looking down the road when you get these countries that are coming close to zero, how do you get, how, how do you really keep them at zero? I think the, the other innovations, and I think Michael alluded to this, it's not just about the technologies, but if you really wanted to do something, you, you it's something critical, you increase the coverage. So the way that the, 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 the space, um, the, the malaria space today is, is funded is, is kind of low, lowest price takes all. That 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 uh, there's a limit amount to limited amount of funding to go around, and you want to cover as many people. But as Michael said, you've got to cover, you've got to give people coverage with the best technologies. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of work going into formulation and delivery to, to get cost down, and also and also the technology ar around the polymer chemistry and how you coat or impregnate nets. Something else Michael, Michael, Michael alluded to, he talked about, I, I think, um, he, he talked about kind of recycling of nets and, and biodegradation of nets, which is something we looked at. If you go back about six or seven years, there really wasn't an appetite for that. I think today there is. I think that's changed. We, we, we had access to some technologies. But something else that we need to look at is user-centric design, and we, we've We've neglected that. It, it, we've always done the build it and they will come. And actually, that's that, that that's really there's many examples of where that hasn't happened. So there's there's a whole there's a whole range of places to innovate in in how you monitor, uh, uh, in 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 how you how you apply these chemistries, um, and, and also in the kind of the base technologies around around polymer chemistry and the nets themselves. So you know there's a number of things you you can do. Uh, it's just not it not just about nets and IRS, but as, again, Michael said it, and I think, and I'm trying to stay out of this talking about this space. But if you go to any modelling group, the Institute of, of, of Disease Modelling or Imperial College that we work with very closely, uh, they're going to tell you that 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 the vector control is the baseline intervention, and everything else builds on that. And and that vector control helps is a big support to all the other technologies that are coming down the pipe. So sorry, it's a long answer. It could be a lot longer. <laughs> no, it's it's great, Nick. And you know, one one of the things that <clears throat> is implicit in what you and others are saying is, you know, in a in a in a functioning marketplace, when you have new products, improvements, innovations, new tools, uh, the 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 market size should grow, right? We should be seeing more more resources. Uh, for that broader set of tools. And hopefully that's the case as we expand into some of the innovations that you described as we move into 
uh, the rollout at scale of, of effective vaccines. We, can, we I, can I add something to that, Martin? Yeah, please. We're making decisions about go or no-go chemistries on the basis of, of 30, 40 cents, whether you can afford that chemistry. That chemistry is, we'll probably never get another one like it. Uh, we will, um, through time, most of these chemical costs come down. But that's how, that's how, that's how difficult this is. We're losing technology because somebody is saying we can't afford an extra 50 cents in a bed net, or if you really wanted a bed net that was resistant to um, uh, was resistance to, to resistance, you would put two active ingredients on the bed net. Well, that's even more expensive. So, and I, I, I just throw out an example. I, I had eye surgery, it cost 25,000 and it hardly made any difference to my, <laughs> to, to, to my site. And I didn't bat an eyelid and, and that, that $25,000 would have, would have, you know, would, would have potentially covered many thousands of people with, you know, with, 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 with bed nets. So, you know, cost is, it's a relative thing, but actually these technologies are very cheap for the, for the amount of uh, impact they, 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 they return. And we're talking a few dollars per person uh, per year applied. So I just want to get us out of that thinking at some point, as, as has been done in the drug world, we're going to have to pay more for things that work better. Uh, and, and if you don't, uh, you, you're going to take, you're really going to have low end interventions and no, and no innovators in the space um, to bring new, new products along. Well, and, and some of the numbers we talked about today make, make a case from an outcome standpoint, right? You described uh, the study in the Lancet in March and 50, 5% lower odds yeah. uh, after a after, uh, period of time uh, when you use new insecticides. You know, if, if it's a incremental increase in price to get a, a dramatic decline in risk, um, you know, we need to be doing that math and, and investing accordingly. Arnon, uh, want to ask you, you've, you've seen phenomenal results from your work in places like Ghana and, and Sao Tome. Um, what do you see as the, the opportunities for expansion of, of ZAP's work? And what would it take to roll this out at scale? You know, partners like the US President's Malaria Initiative are in 27 countries, 24 in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, what, what kind of scale do you see as potential for the innovations you're leading? Yeah, <clears throat> I think that our results from uh, Santome and from Ghana most interestingly is the cost per person protected um, because the cost per person protected of flaviciding in urban area, if done properly, is 20 cents. It's sometimes like 90% cheaper than IRS or even more. In, in uh, villages, it's more like $1 or a bit more. So, so I think the very trivial thing to do, if we focus only on urban and semi-urban areas, which is if you take like the 27 uh, countries PMI country is about a half a billion people in risk of malaria. And then you want to protect all of them, all of them. I think it's like, it would cost if you uh, multiply it by uh, 20 cents, it's like only $100 million for the entire 27 PMI countries. So I think we can, if we take love thing to country, we can make huge impact with relatively a, a small budget. Um, obviously, what is more interesting for us, and this is what we're, what we're trying to do in Santome, is really uh, to eliminate malaria based, as I told, not only on larvae sighting, but on also on combination of tools. But this is a, a maybe story for uh, another time. Uh, I think for the PMI, um, it takes just to try, uh, uh, because uh, we're too we are focused on the core intervention, which is bed nets and IRS, which are very important and good, and by the way, very synergic to larvae siding, uh, synergetic. But we must like uh, use some percent, two percent, three percent for innovation in technology, for innovation in implementation, and bring in very interesting technologies like ours. Thanks, thanks, Hernan. Uh you know, picking up on one of the points you say, it, it's not about applying these tools in a, in a blanket fashion. It's really about understanding the ROI 
of application of the tools in specific settings. You know, you you talk about population density as a crit critical determinant of the uh, efficiency of, of larviciding. Uh, that's a great example of, of what we need to do moving forward. Maybe a, a question to open to the group and, and Michael, maybe you can start. You know, we were, we were talking uh, before the discussion went live about Operation Warp Speed and, and you know, what was demonstrated in terms of the speed to market, you know, the R&D and speed to market in the context of COVID. How do we create an Operation Warp Speed for malaria? Uh, you know, we've talked about the urgency of child dying every, every minute. This is an emergency every single day. What are the, what are the barriers to, to achieving the same thing for not the newest pandemic, but what you might say is arguably the world's oldest pandemic, malaria? Yeah, um, so I mean, I think we think about quite frequently, so it's a great question. Um, I mean, it's clear, right, that the fight against malaria is a drop in the ocean in comparison to the, whatever, 13, 14 trillion dollars of economic impact we've had uh, from COVID and the tens of billions of dollars we spent um, on vaccines and so on. So the world can do stuff when the world wants to do stuff. Um, and therein lies part of the problem and probably part of the discussion as well is how much do the local countries actually want this and recognize this as a socioeconomic issue um, in addition to a public health or, a, 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 you know, an eight, $8 issue. Um, <clears throat> but, but for me, I think the part that we can do better at in the malaria community is to better articulate what it is we want. And I think we too often simply say we need more money, which is true, um, would help, but it is not on its own a, um, a strategy, right? And I think we're missing really this dialogue um, at the malaria, let's say community level. Uh, what can all these different tools do? What different tools can we get? And even within the bed net industry, there is that missing dialogue. What, what can we get? And I've just said as, as the largest manufacturer uh, of bed nets, who supplied almost 1 billion of those uh, bed nets that you talked about earlier on, uh, we can see the opportunities. We can see the abilities to reduce costs further, but they, they, they come with a kind of um, a, a malaria community um, assessment and they come with a malaria community strategy rather than just a, say, Vestigar uh, strategy. And, and this, this platform needs to be created. And I think uh, it's organizations like yours, events like these, uh, and more that we can, uh, that can really be instrumental in helping uh, to build those and provide those and, and lead uh, the discussion. Maybe, Thanks. Maybe, Thanks. I can, maybe I can add to, to yeah, please, Nick. what's been said. I, I mean, it, 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 takes, it takes 12 years to get a new product to market. It's crazy, it shouldn't take 12 years. And certainly a novel active ingredient takes 12 years. And, and I agree, it's not, it's not about the money. There are, there are mechanisms um, to, to truncate this. Uh, that, that could be easily uh, integrated into, into the way we work. Um, I, I, think, I think product development is kind of on a, is on a, on a trajectory, it's on a straight line trajectory. You know, what, what, what's going on around this, we can't manage. You know, governments change, the CEOs of the, of the innovator companies change, public health priorities change, but the PDP or the development process need, needs, some, needs, need, needs some stability. I think I think we learned actually with Zika. We we were involved. We as a PDP, we did a quick kind of a, a pivot to work on the Zika Zika challenges back six seven years ago. And today, it's like it's never it never ever happened. I thought you know we we all that innovation that was was created around that would would find a would find a path and find a home and could be used elsewhere. I'm a little disappointed that didn't happen. As as the moment Zika declined, we we kind of. We, 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 we kind of, it's like it, it, the whole thing went away and the pressure went away and yet we could have utilized it. I hope we can take this learning of getting a vaccine through in, in, in a year, a safe vaccine to say, okay, we might not be able to do uh, a, a novel net with a, with a completely novel insecticide um, in a year, but we might be able to do it in five. Um, you know, we, we can we can reduce the the, the the length of time testing. We know what a, a dead mosquito is is a dead mosquito, 
you know, we can we can do work in parallel, formulation development, save many, many months. We can evaluate products at scale uh, in, in kind of practical field use scale up situations without the need for expensive and often unreliable RCTs. So I think, and, and there are other mechanisms that the PRV, Priority Review Voucher, that was introduced in 2007 and 2008 for drugs. We've been working, IVCC has been working for five years with the same team at Duke University to do the same things for vaccines. It, it creates an incentive to innovator, in, innovators um, to, get in, to, to get involved and without actually providing a huge amount of cash, it just gives you a kind of a get out of jail card free that you can apply to a, a commercially viable product. So there are lots and lots of, me of mechanisms. And, and, and the other one I'd say is, um, it's, ju it's just the, the, the NGOs, the whole community, if it was to work together, like we we're all part of a big family trying to solve the same problem, um, I, I think we, we, we have a chance of breaking down some of these barriers. And a, a lot of our work is, is identifying those barriers and sort of quietly as much as possible behind the scenes to try and break them down. And some of that, some of that has happened, for example, in creating GLP certified sites across Africa so that the data generated does not have to be repeated. Uh, it's only done once and that saves a lot of time. So I, 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 there's, I, I totally agree with Michael. There are, there are things that can be d d done here. Money is important, um, but actually it goes way beyond. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Uh, I would turn to Arnon, but I think we may have lost him to the um, inconsistent power in, in Mozambique, uh, and, and he dropped from the call. Uh, good reminder to all of us of the frontline setting in which this work actually happens and, and the challenges that, uh, th that we face. So this has been a fantastic session. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's done a lot to help us uh, broaden the conversation. You know, this isn't about static tools that are tried and true and, and forgotten about. It's really about relentless innovation, uh, relentless innovation in terms of kind of strengthening those tools and, and sustaining them in the face of constant biological pressures um, and, and also constant innovation in terms of uh, new applications, uh, filling gaps in the market. Nick, you mentioned, for instance, outdoor biting as a as a key challenge. Um, so thanks, thanks to all three of you for your leadership in this space. Uh, none of this would have happened over the past 15 years if it weren't for your institutions. And we certainly won't get to the end game and, and live up to our name of making malaria no more if we don't continue to, to innovate in this space. Uh, so thanks to you all for your work. Thanks, thanks for your time. Uh, Michael, thanks to you InvestorGuard for your sponsorship of this session uh, and keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Martin. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Bye, everyone. Thanks.